Hello, welcome. Maybe a couple of introductions of this. Uh, I'll be about. I want to do it. I want to do it. So we're just waiting for one more, I think, and then we're good. Yes. One more, Kelly? Uh, no, we got both of them. Travel for all we, and them. Yeah, if we've got travel. two more, we're good. So we're good to go? Yes. Who's travel we are for all? Right now. Okay, we're I'm starting to call. I'm Sharita, and I'm sorry this makes the very first meeting, but I am the owner of Travel for All, which is the travel agency. That arranges vacations for people with any type of disability. We take specific requirements to this. Some folks with disability. Okay, I'm going to stop everybody because I'm now going to call a special uh, meeting to order. Is there any introduction of lead items? None from staff. None. Anybody from here? No. Uh, can I have adoption of the agenda? Would your other business technically be considered a late item for COVID related? No, we'll bring that in under other business then, Richard, no problem. I already have it on my list. So can I have a move, uh, somebody move the adoption of the agenda? Moved by Councillor Markman, seconder? I second. Sorry, this is to move as amended to include an item under other business to do with COVID? Yeah, okay. All in favor? What I'll do is I'll just ask you to raise your hand if you're in favor. And then uh, now, anybody opposed? Yep. None opposed, okay. Now I'll look for the adoption of the minutes. If I could have a mover and a seconder. Yep, okay. Okay, I, I can't see Sandra. Sandra, moved by Sandra, seconded by, I can't see the names. I second it, Serena. Seconded by Serena. All in favor? Or, sorry, discussion? Aye. Okay, aye. Perfect. <laughs> so we're going to do a presentation, but before we do that, I know I'm going to go off a little bit, but uh, I want to uh, go around the table so we have some introductions so people know who's who in the Zoom. So obviously, Cheryl Armstrong, Councillor. Uh, Lisa Bopal Singh, Manager of Community Planning. Lynn Wark, Director of Recreation and Culture. Lara Clarkson, Recreation Manager. Zenny Martin, Councillor. Richard Harding, General Manager of Park Recreation and Culture. Karen Robertson, Deputy City Clerk. Oh, really? Kelly. <laughs> Kelly, Recording Secretary. Hello, oh, I'm Derek, I'm with the IT Department. I'm Madeline Cohen with the Transportation Group. Christian oh. McDonald, Parks and Open Space Planner. And Scott Newlands, Parks Project Coordinator. The young guy we call. Nice and loud, and strong, I like that. <laughs> Gotta go. All right, so we're going to start off with a presentation, which is the uh, City Spark Coordinator, and that will be introduced by Ms. Paul Did you want me to do a quick wire sure. room? Oh, hang on. Changing that. You guys that. didn't even include the people in the Zoom. Oh, okay. That's right. I guess we just assume you see each other. Go around then. Go ahead. We'll start with you, Richard. Uh, Richard Harlow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Deborah? Deborah Holland. Next is uh, Teresa. Is it Teresa? Yes, Teresa Travel for All. Sandra? Sandra Hamill. Ailey? I don't think she is. I don't think she can hear us. Adrian? Hi, thank you for the bring. Nice to see everyone. And I don't think Eileen's hearing us, but she'll let us know. Maybe able to call her. Uh, I chatted with her already, and I think I think she can hear us. It's just we can't. Does she not have her audio on? I did. I, I asked her to try. turn up the volume on her device, and she said she would try. Okay. Thank you. All right. We can communicate through the text chat. Yeah, we're not supposed to do that, but. Because the chat is live streamed. Because it's live streamed and we have to keep all of that, and it's just it's uh, not the best thing to do for meetings. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Harding. So just for the committee's uh, uh, recollection, when we first met, one of the things we, we mentioned to you was a variety of planning processes were underway that we thought uh, was a great timing for the um, the committee to be a part of. Uh, so Lisa Bopal Singh has, has graciously come to do an overview of all the plans, which includes the OCP update, park recreation culture, accessibility, um, 
um, accessibility transportation. What's the, what's the term called? Um, active, transportation. active transportation. That's why Madeline's also here, and then a few other plans. So we just thought it would be a good way to kind of kick this meeting off. We're going to come back and give you an overview of where we're at with it and what some of the next steps, but also so you have a, that broader background of processes that we see. Again, a lot of information coming to this committee and then from this committee as those plans are developed over the next two years. I'll turn it over to Lisa. Okay, hello everyone, and if you, I'm going to try and speak loudly, I do have a soft voice, so for those on the screen, if you can't hear, you can maybe let Kelly know, or um, feel, feel free to uh, interrupt. So what I'm going to do today is spend a few minutes going over, as uh, Mr. Harding said, our coordinated strategic policy review process. I'm going to start by giving you an overview of what that is. Um, you'll see the name City Square being used there. Uh, the status of the project and then the next step, where we're at and how this committee fits in with that process. So, like, can the clicker in front of you has been cleaned oh. and it is working. Thank you. Okay. And, and we're going to point, point Kelly. Anywhere. You don't pick it up. Go. At the back you see? Okay. There you go. Okay, there we go. So those are the three things I'm going to cover today. So starting with the overview. Um, so as some of you may or may not be familiar with, um, depending on your involvement with local governments, most local governments have an official community plan and it's a document that is basically uh, one that's created with a lot of input from community. It sets the stage for how communities wish to grow, how they're going to accommodate future um, residential needs, industrial needs, um, so economic needs, recreation, and it basically sets the framework for land use, um, land use planning for the next anywhere from 20 to 50 years, depending on the community. Now, best practice is, is that every 10 years, these plans get updated, and so our official community plan was last reviewed and updated in 2008, so it's um, time for a refresh and review of that. And as we were looking at this, um, there were several other key plans, I've got one missing on there, but several other key plans that also are due for a refresh. And so the thought was, is instead of each plan coming out to our community for engagement, that there's a way of integrating how we engage with our community on these plans. So you'll see the Parks, Rec and Culture Master Plan, the Climate Action Plan, um, the Water Supply Strategic Plan, Economic Development Plan, and another one that should be there is also the Active and Sustainable Transportation Plan. And so typically, most local governments will engage our community in each one plan at a time, and we have an opportunity to try and streamline how we talk to our community about the future, and then look at opportunities for where we can even integrate these plans together. So some key pieces we need to update some of these plans include climate change. We do have these considerations in our official community plan, but since 2008, we, we know that there are many more things that we could be doing strategically to make our community more resilient. Reconciliation is another important theme for our city and for our council. Sustainable service delivery. And then also equally important, and these aren't in any order of uh, importance, but they're ones that we know um, through our council are important to this process, is inclusion and diversity. So council have endorsed the following guiding principles, and they might be a little difficult to see on your screens, I'm not sure, but I'll quickly read them out. These are the guiding principles for this process as endorsed by council. One is to build on successful policies and existing documents. So where we know things are working, um, for example, uh, one example might be looking at trying to build communities where people can walk to where they work, live and play, uh, to continue with different strategies that support that. So for example, you may have noticed over time that there's more development of apartment buildings, whether they're rental or market, 
in areas close to malls, whether it's uh, or along corridors with its transportation. These are things that we want to continue building on. Um, the other pieces are council has identified in their strategic plan several themes. And uh, the themes, you'll see them, the blue bubbles, they're a little hard to read. Uh, economic health, environmental responsibility, governance and excellence, and livability. And livability is probably the one that is especially relevant to your committee here and the work that you're doing. So a lot of the uh, pieces around accessibility, inclusion, and uh, diversity in our community come under that livability theme of councils. The other pieces, other guiding principles are acknowledging the priorities of climate change, reconciliation, and sustainable service delivery, as I mentioned before, um, including robust community engagement in the creation of plans and strategies. So that's exactly why we are before you today. Um, Providing a clear and coordinated vision to guide community building for the next 25 years. So again, that fits with um, the intention of a community plan. And to provide a method which allows for the evaluation and measurement of plans and strategies. So making sure that in any of the plans that we're developing, we come up with ways to measure, to set targets, and to figure out um, how to measure progress and see how effective the different strategies we're doing are. And I was always going to add, if it's not too disruptive, I'm quite open to any interruptions um, from the committee and any questions, because I'm covering a lot in a fairly short space of time. So Council has endorsed the terms of reference for this work, and I won't go through this in detail, but perhaps I could ask if we could share this with the committee. It is um, online, uh, it's on one of the council agendas going back, um, I can't remember the exact date, but uh, if we could share that, that would be helpful for you. And um, the key elements of the terms of reference that I'd like to uh, point out to you is the use of city committees like yours as an important piece uh, for engagement, getting feedback on the city spark process, um, coming back to you with the results of public engagement, getting your feedback on our different um, implementation and approaches to community engagement, and uh, your committee in particular uh, plays an important role in guiding us and making sure that we're addressing barriers to people who traditionally have found it difficult for a range of reasons to engage in city planning um, processes. So, with that. So, I, I mentioned earlier that with the official community plan, it had it guides land use and decisions. I won't go over that again, but that document is online, and that's the one that we are using to frame all the other plans and the engagement around. And I know that uh, Christy McDonald, who is in the back here, will also be speaking to you about the Parks, Rec, and Culture Plan. And to show you the integration, one of the neat things about this process that perhaps I didn't go into was that it, it is a really collaborative internal process across all departments. And so we have a technical team. You'll see also Madeline Coe, who's with the uh, Transportation Department, who's with us today. And then over time, regularly, we have meetings, several other staff people who are involved. And so not only is this an integrated process from the community's point of view externally, it is one where uh, internally it's, it's been, it is a very collaborative process. So again, one of the hopes is that we don't throw out aspects of our planning that was done. Um, I don't know, some of you may remember something called Vision Nanaimo or Plan Nanaimo way back and Imagine Nanaimo. So all of these uh, processes are, are things, there are many elements that we want to continue and build on over time, not completely throw out things that maybe uh, have been successful. And here you can see a picture of downtown where you have um, you know, a patio on the street, um, examples of different types of land uses downtown and the type of vibrancy we're wanting to see in other parts of our city. So where are we at? So basically last year, um, in the fall of 2019 and winter 2020, we 
had council approve the guiding principles, the terms of reference, and we started background research. And I'll tell you a little bit about where we're at with that in a minute. So where we're at right now, if you can see the box outlining the second stage, is looking at exploring issues and opportunities and looking at engaging and consulting with the community actively around that. And I think I'm just going to quickly look at my slides. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is that we will be going to council on May 25th. Um, I think I'm jumping in a little bit. Um, with, uh, to get council's endorsement on our approach to engagement. And then we'll be coming back to you as a committee for further guidance um, on that. So where are we at? So terms of reference have been approved by council. Our internal teams have been coordinated. We've hired Lanark consultants to be the um, lead consultant on this process. We have, uh, through our communications department, we have uh, selected an engagement and branding um, approach. The logo you'll see there, City Spark. We selected a software uh, called Bang the Table that we are calling um, Get Involved in the Nanaimo. Uh, and then we've had a variety of studies and background study research completed. And then we have, in the last few weeks, um, made adaptations mm -hmm. so that we can go forward um, with uh, engagement during COVID as we either have to uh, continue our, our uh, um, approaches to engagement, like virtual meetings like this, and as we may be able to re return to a new normal going forward. So, in terms of background research, uh, the Parks Rec and Culture have done some GIS analysis around uh, their trails and I think uh, different work that's necessary to the study. We've also done a land inventory and capacity analysis and that's essentially a study that looks at what proportions of our city are currently under use for residential, commercial, industrial, institutional uses like schools and hospitals. Um, and also parks, um, and what's the capacity of the land that we have to grow with community needs. So both um, the uh, uh, residential and industrial demands that we anticipate having, and then also how that fits with our environmental protection and things like steep slopes and other considerations. The other thing we've done is we've also done an demographic analysis, and as we come back, she will provide some updates on, on these studies after council has received that information. Okay, so on to community engagement. Uh, we'll be coming back to you with more information on this as soon as we've got direction from council. And uh, one of the things to show you is that a big focus of this is trying to really reach um, community members who traditionally, for a variety of reasons, either due to their age, gender, um, their different socioeconomic status, maybe even their ethnicity or race, typically haven't been able to or um, be as engaged in community planning processes. So that is a big focus and then our challenge, of course, going forward is how to do this creatively in a world where engagement with COVID um, can interestingly provide more access perhaps to some people with barriers by actually having remote meetings, uh, but can also limit certain types of access for people who have other challenges. So that's something that we hope we'll be able to get some good feedback from this committee on. Okay, so this, this graphic I quite liked. It was done by our communications um, manager some time ago uh, for council and it shows a variety of different ways of engaging graphically. And so in terms of guiding principles for engagement, we want to be very clear with community and, and council has seen this slide before. Um, there is an international uh, standard for public participation known as IAP2 and you'll see along the top 
uh, there are different ways of engaging with community members. One is to inform, one is where you give um, the community information, one is to consult where you ask for feedback and you do focus groups and surveys, one is to involve where you work more directly with the public and you uh, talk about how to address some of their concerns and then it goes on to collaborate where you come up with solutions to different um, challenges or ways of achieving goals and then the last one is empower where the public makes the decision and what we're showing here is that we're quite high on the spectrum the intent is to work with the community in a collaborative way to get these plans done and then in terms of the last piece because we have a democratic system here in Canada is that um, council will implement um, and take into consideration all that work, but will ultimately make the decision. So, come to kind of point that out. So, next steps, as I mentioned on Monday. Uh, Excuse me. Yes. I was just going to ask for questions after the presentation, Richard. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, next steps, next Monday, a draft engagement strategy will be going to council that's been prepared by our consultants and then pending their approval we would like to return to this committee and uh, other committees for feedback and support on implementing the coming up with different implementation action items for the engagement strategy so and that was the end so richard just at the end here so hi Saskia to you all um, and happy to take questions Okay, um, we'll wait till I get back on the Zoom thing, Zoom train. But Richard, you can start because I know you were the first one to ask, so. Okay, um, I just have a question. Will that PowerPoint be shared with them? Yes, it, it is uh, part of your agenda package, and yes. It's a, yeah, it's part of the it, agenda package. Yeah, you currently, yeah, you currently have it on your agenda package, and. If you wanted it as a separate PowerPoint, I'm sure it could be uploaded somewhere. Okay, I, I just wasn't sure if it was the exact same thing because I can't very easily view what's on the screen. Uh, yeah, my yeah. apologies. Yes, it's exactly what you have in your agenda package. Is there any other questions? I'll ask you to raise your hand. Okay, Sandra? Yeah, so when I was looking at the four considerations, climate change, reconciliation, sustainable, and inclusion. I'm just curious about how you are looking to incorporate those into the plans. Like, is there a guiding principles for each one? Or I'm just curious about what the plan is and how to integrate them and to make sure that it's done in kind of the same way for each of the plans. Uh, that's a very good question. I think right now we don't have one set approach and we would be looking to the different committees to get some guidance on that and then our consultants of course in terms of the questions we're asking the community would be focusing on that feedback for engaging the community and then also looking at best practices to guide us that, that we're seeing from other areas. So with this committee, if you have any best practices that you'd like to share with us and that we can provide back to our consultants, that would be helpful. So one of the things, and I'm not speaking on behalf of everyone, but the federal government and the provincial government here is looking at GDA Plus, which is a tool to analyze um, diversity um, in programs, services, and policies that are put in place and ask some probing questions and principles to look at. So I know on the federal government website, it's the modules are free and you can go through it. It might be something that you might wanna um, look at and I could definitely get some more information and um, talk about it maybe at a different meeting or offline, but that's something that's being implemented in other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandra, would you mind sending the link to that to us all? That'd be really appreciated. Yeah. I wouldn't mind yeah. looking at it myself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And actually, I just realized I should be going through the chair. Don't worry about okay. mm -hmm. uh, Sandra, it. Sandra, uh, I'm actually familiar the province has done something similar, and I think that also aligns. So. Um, yeah, like if you do a cabinet commission or a treasury board, they it walks you through that process. But definitely, yeah. every program and service needs to yeah. um, address certain elements. Uh, this is, 
similar to your right? But GPA plus is definitely um, something that um, that is the focus. And perhaps one thing through the chair I will point out is that some of these plans are quite, um, like the overall community plan um, is quite high level in terms of strategy, yeah. but coming out of that uh, and this integrated process, maybe implementation plans that are more detailed, um, for which that actually applies even more strongly, and I'm not saying it doesn't yeah. apply to the overall, but some of the more specific, yeah. like where you get programs and things like that. Um, but where those two guiding um, approaches from the province and the feds fit in is in how we go about and maybe even make reference to those documents. Yeah. Thank Correct. You. Yeah. And, and how you engage as well. Yes. It can help. Yeah. Uh, is there any other questions? Just raise your hand. Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to Mafia Sutton Park, which will be introduced by Mr. Hardy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lisa, for the presentation on it. And again, these are, uh, again, use as a bit of background information of uh, some of the uh, projects underway, which will, will help uh, stimulate some discussion as we get into your work on your work plan after this next presentation. So one of the things that we did talk about on our inaugural meeting was to try and bring some actual projects that we're working on um, so you can see what we're doing and also um, maybe as we move forward on other phases, particularly with this project has a couple phases to it, but we see where we've come, um, where we're at today, where of course we're all closed our playgrounds right now, but this one's still under construction. But this is our, our, our real strong attempt for the last couple of years of creating a, a complete inclusive playground. And Chris McDonald and Scott Newlands have been working on the project, uh, both on the planning side and then managing the project with Scott. We can go through the where we're at, at to date. And again, we're hoping that every meeting will bring a different project to you. Um, I know um, Active Transportation um, has some projects they want to also bring forward on with you. So this is, again, kind of keep to that initial meeting we had of bringing some things to you. So I'll turn it over to Kirsten McDonald. Thank you, Richard. So the Mafia Sutton Park Inclusive Playground Project actually started three years ago. Uh, in 2017, Council received a delegation from the Nanaimo, um, Rotary. Nanaimo Rotary and the Nanaimo uh, Child Development Centre as well, and endorsed moving ahead with an inclusive playground project in Nanaimo. And uh, the playground at Mafeo Sutton Park had reached the end of its life and was requiring uh, an update anyway, and so we decided to use that as our site for Nanaimo's first inclusive play project. And since then, staff have been working with the Child Development Centre as a key partner, as well as the Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island and the Nanaimo First Nations. An inclusive playground is a best practice for a play environment to include people of all ages and abilities. And it promotes universal access, as well as having specialized equipment to allow everyone to access the site and be integrated in the site. Throughout Nanaimo's 70 plus playgrounds, we have accessible elements in the playgrounds, but we don't have any playgrounds that are fully universally accessible or are fully inclusive. So this is the first one in a city of Nanaimo uh, Park. There is also uh, a couple of inclusive playgrounds that have been introduced recently through the school district. So one of the main facets of inclusive play is that it address, addresses the seven senses. And I have to admit that until starting this project, I thought there were only five senses. And I have since learned that balance and uh, vestibular sensory um, is a very important part of child development, as well as how your body is positioned in the world, which is proprioception. And all seven of those senses are taken into account when developing play equipment for an inclusive park. Um, the other senses, such as hearing and, and seeing and touching, also have their special elements that Scott and I will uh, briefly touch upon how they're integrated into the play. But essentially, every surface that's on the play equipment is considered 
for its coloring, for its tactile nature, how many uh, different levels of um, stimulation there are, as well as uh, future phases of the park will also have some elements of sound incorporated into them for, for play. So the, the senses can be engaged through many activities in uh, an inclusive park, including sliding, spinning, swinging, climbing, and touch, as we touched upon. And the social integration and engaging others is also a very important part of an inclusive playground. And integrating seating and having people of all ages will touch upon more, but that's one of the main goals of this project. Um, the feature that you can see on the right, which is um, an inclusive zip line, is one of the key features of our, of our new park, and we'll mention that more, but it's called a zip cruise. And again, the surfacing and the seating is really hoping that all caregivers of all ages are comfortable interacting in the park, and also that people with strollers, wheelchairs, um, or limited mobility can also access the features. So the playground at Matthew Sutton Park, you've probably all seen it, but it is uh, nestled along beside the lagoon and also adjacent to the pavilion. Uh, if you can see the image, it's circled um, and visible. It's adjacent to a playground area as well, and it leads to the Newcastle Island Ferry Terminal. That is also the um, location of the new playground. And previously, it had, had a sand safety surface base. This is an image of the previous playground. It was made out of wood, and it featured a lot of ramps. But it was very difficult to access if you were meeting somebody on the site, and it had a lot of limitations uh, for, for children of, of all ages and abilities, actually. And it also was over 30 years old and was needing, um, needing to be upgraded to meet CSA requirements. So I know this is a small image, but what is planned is actually a three-phase project. And phase one is this, the pink pod in the middle. And it is catering mostly to five to 12-year-olds. Closer to the lagoon is a future phase, uh, probably a water park or some spray features, but that's actually our, our phase three. And we're hoping to, in a few years' time, be able to complete a second phase, which will be really catering to two to five-year-olds, and it, uh, it's right adjacent to the, the existing phase one. And the new uh, Rotary Garden, which is being developed also under construction right now on the northwest corner of the park. Um, I'm actually just going to go back to this slide for a moment. Um, Mafeo Sutton Park is at a very important location historically for the SFN. It was a seasonal village on the estuary, and one of the purposes of the village was really to capture coho salmon um, when they came through in the fall. Mature salmon lay row on the banks of the Millstone River, and were a key feature of um, the food gathering system for the First Nations people. And that story of this site will be woven into many features that are included in the playground. In addition to the landmark structure that has been donated from the Child Development Center, um, There's a variety of surface types that are featured in the playground and a, a number of public art features. As I said before, we're going to take all questions at the end of the. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. No problem. So, the Nanaimo Child Development Center donated this structure that you can see. It's a, a, called a Super Netflix, and it's a very tall inclusive play feature uh, which dominates the site right now, the phase one site. And it was a very generous donation of over $100,000 that was made available through the Child Deve Development Center and also our partner, the Island's Health, Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island. 
and it's really driven a lot of the doors on what the public's going in. It's driven a lot of the other design elements that Scott will be talking more about on site. Uh, as you can see, it is um, colored red, gold, and black. And that's the key color scheme for the whole park. And that is, um, those colors have been chosen to help represent the spawning salmon and the row that were, um, that are present even now in the Millstone River. And also the gold and black were chosen by an artist that we're working with to integrate public art in the, in the park. And this feature is um, central, it has a central um, cylinder in the middle that children can pull themselves up on and slide down. And it is, it's facilitated by a number of, of uh, ramps at the middle. And it's really hard to describe without watching a video on it. But if you'd like to either try it out <laughs> in the future or uh, look at Netplex structures on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You'd be able to see how children of all abilities can actually navigate this, this structure and then come down an option of three slides. Um, and it's, it's a, an incredible piece in the park. Um, it has been created by a company called Landscape Structures. And Landscape Structures is um, actually providing all the playground equipment in phase one of the park. They have several design advisors with, um, that are experts in the fields of inclusive play. And one of them is Dr. Lucy Miller. And she herself is visually impaired and has a, a foundation uh, called the Sensory Processing Foundation. And another advisor has been um, Ingrid Kansas, who's an occupational therapist who is herself in a wheelchair. And they have been extremely involved in the design of all the play structures not specific to our park, but in general. And Ingrid Kansas has also looked at the overall design for our park. Um, so that's a very exciting um, element to see if, to see what her um, advice was on, on the overall design. So these pictures were taken last week, or the bottom picture was last week in the park. It's actually progressed a lot further since. Uh, the last couple of weeks have been really the time that the safety surfacing has been brought into the park. And uh, as you can see, there's some wood fiber. There's also some rubber that's going into the park. And um, there's pavement and concrete and a lot of landscaping and natural materials as well. Uh, the uh, picture to the upper left is the overall view of phase one. And adjacent to that is phase two and, and phase three. but. That's the overall look of phase one. It's really hard to capture the scope of the project right now in these images um, because it is such a large, wide project. Um, but there's more than you can see in the photos that are actually under construction. And I'm going to invite my colleague Scott now to come and talk about the construction process as it's been unfolding and also more of the inclusive play uh, features that have been included very thoughtfully in the design process. Before we move though, I'm going to ask you the questions of what, what's been said so sure. far. So I think, was it, um, who had the question? Was it you, Adrian? It wasn't me. I do have a question, but I, there was someone ahead of me for sure. Okay, it was me, it was Teresa. Okay, Teresa. My, uh, my question is around the areas where it is mostly predominantly sand. Wheelchairs don't tend to move very well in the sand. Is there going to be any type of a wheelchair or a, they call them beach or a pinky chair that move in the sand for people, for children or adults for that matter, that cannot navigate the sand in the wheelchair? This new phase actually has no sand or pea gravel. It features rubber and wood fiber with special ramps under it. Uh, so I think you'll, I hope that there's more accessibility there should be um, with the new safety surfacing. The rubber is completely flush and there's no lips uh, or anything to help allow walk, walkers, wheelchairs, and strollers on it. Thank you. So, so, so someone tested out the um, 
the like a wood chip. But does anyone tell us about what it is like to move with in a wheelchair or with a stroller and think in that particular um, area of the park? There, there is quite a bit of wood chip, and I'm going to let Scott speak more to some of the unique design to this site that we haven't done at other places to try and facilitate wheelchairs moving through the wood fiber. Technically, it is considered an accessible surface, but we know that it doesn't allow the same movement as rubber. But rubber is about eight times the cost of wood fiber, and unfortunately, we, we couldn't afford in this phase to put rubber throughout the whole site, but potentially down the road through some grants, um, that might be an, an opportunity. But at this time, it's a combination of rubber and wood fiber. Okay, just one last question. Is there actually a wheelchair swing? There are swings that are out to where you actually remain in your wheelchair and you swing. There's several actually that are going to are be there, included. Okay. There, there, they may not be, there's, there's several types of wheelchair swings. So these ones, and I think I do have a picture. Yeah, a picture in the show beginning. Yeah. Here's the very beginning. Hmm. Clicker is frozen, it seems. These are ones with the, the child or, or adult or whoever remains in the wheelchair. I believe there are two buckets on the swing set. There's a swing set that's in this picture that's, um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's on the top, uh, top left. Thank you. There, this is a really great picture. That's the zip one of the bucket. So there's a bucket on the zip line, and there's actually two zip lines, one with a bucket and one without a bucket. And then on the swing set, which I believe has eight swings, two of them are buckets. One of them is for two to five year olds, and one is for adults um, or old, older children. And then there is also um, a group swing, which is a big disc which allows many people of different abilities, thank you, to get on uh, and play at the same time. So they have to actually be taken out of their wheelchair. That is correct. They cannot remain in their wheelchair. That is correct for swinging. Uh, there is one element that Scott's going to talk about where a wheelchair can actually drive right on and be part of more of a, a swaying motion, and it's actually called a sway fund. Okay, thanks, and now we're going to go on to Adrian. You had a question? Thank you for taking my question. It relates so closely to this question um, that I, I think it fits nicely now. Um, just further to the surfaces um, and the, the variety of surfaces, I thank you so much for considering different surfaces within the park. I just wanted to add that having the best possible surfaces for mobility is so important because it is it is not just somebody helping somebody who has mobility challenges through the park. It is somebody being able to navigate the park on their own. And not necessarily the child. Um, when I see the surface changing, it makes me happy. This is one of the last places I went through COVID with my kids and uh, running around this park. And you know, um, my brother-in-law used the mobility uh, scooter and would not have been able and could not take our children to the park before. And now I see that there's options for him to do that. But just in thinking about the testing, and I thought that was such an important question about the testing of the service, um, because there's a difference between pushing something with wheels through a surface and actually self-navigating through a surface. Um, and I would love to see a park where my brother-in-law could go with my daughter or, or my son who's getting a little bit to like playgrounds, um, you know, could go on his own and feel that he could manage that um, on any of the surfaces that are in and around the, the play structure. And I just wanted to add how, how um, excited I am about the cultural significance um, of the area and how that's being incorporated into the design. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? 
Okay, we're going to yeah, go. Actually, go ahead, I, Richard. Actually, do you have a question? Um, uh, so the surrounding areas of the actual uh, playground and the actual playground space itself um, is where my question relates to. Um, are you guys including, um, I guess, the landscaping itself um, in different forms of, uh, of the seven senses? Uh, I've actually like, personally seen a like, public garden, for instance, that was influenced by Helen Keller's uh, uh, teachings around uh, multi-sensory kind of experiences and such. And uh, landscaping is very much part of that. And uh, the auditory kind of aspect of it would be extremely helpful for those with like visual impairment to navigate the space. Mm-hmm. Why is it that that's kind of getting added later on? I'll let Christy answer that. There, there definitely are natural elements that will be incorporated in the first phase. There's a, a large planter and some boulders, and then the, the whole site is has a perimeter of mature fir trees on it. But we do hope in future phases to include um, additional planting areas as well as the auditory elements. Unfortunately, we have to make tough choices when it comes to budgets. And so with this one, we, we only had a certain amount of money available for phase one. I believe our next phase is, is budgeted currently for 2023. And we'll be looking for grant money as well um, to try and include as much as possible in those future phases. Um, But the auditory elements um, are a key priority for phase two at the moment. Is there, uh, sorry, just to read that again, will there be any type of a class where someone who reads Braille actually will be able to read and see actually what that particular area has. So anything for someone who reads Braille or who requires Braille? I don't believe there is right now in, in current phase one. That's a great suggestion and I'm, I'm putting that down for further discussion at a later date. So I am going to move on because I'm cognizant of the time and we can ask further questions I after. Just, one of the I'm wondering if the chair is one of the things, that just to Richard here again, is that because everything's closed down right now, one of the opportunities for us with the committee, if you want, is to actually have a site meeting on site and we could, those committee members would like to go through. Um, I know we can go through the site with you and, and get some, some feedback because we have some, because we're not going to be opening playgrounds and particularly this playground for a while given the COVID situation. So we have that opportunity to kind of go through and, and add some, add some of these things that we may, uh, the committee may, may pick up that we either missed or that the designers have missed or some of those, those aspects. Because we are, there is definitely some plantings that are coming in with this. And Scott can get, now go through some of the more detail on the, each piece. But it's an opportunity, if the committee would like, we could set up a time and meet down on the site and Scott would get us uh, our vests and our hard hats as we go through and, and we can go through the site. It's quite accessible right now to get through with the, the asphalt trailway and then the rubber surfacing and it's an opportunity to go through each piece and then also start thinking about that next phase because the next phase um, is, is right beside it and there's um, opportunities then to start thinking about that next phase. So I'll bring that forward under new business. Send me up, Richard. Uh, I'll bring that forward under new business and we're going to turn to Mr. Scott in the next phase. Chair? Scott, sorry, do you want to just give me a nod when you want me to move forward? Sure. Because then I don't think it's working. Oh. Oh. Never mind. <clears throat> So I'm just going to go through a couple of the pieces of equipment that we have on site. Um, construction has been uh, amazing and challenging for this project and, and like Richard explained, um, there are so many opportunities uh, still to be had within this space that is under construction as well as space two and, and beyond and, and thinking about those important pieces um, around those sites as well. Um, getting in, getting out, and and how everyone can interact with the space in a positive way. So some of the play equipment uh, that was selected for this phase one project, again focusing on the uh, importance of inclusion and giving people the opportunity to um, enjoy, have fun, socialize, uh, uh, use their imagination, and really feel happy in this space. 
So on the left hand side of the slide we've got our we go round and this is the uh, accessible piece where a wheelchair can actually roll from a rubber hard surface, safety surface, into um, the merry-go-round so it spins around and around and these have been added in a lot of uh, playground projects um, on the island across BC. Very, very popular piece. Um, however, the unique and special thing about this piece of equipment is you can actually propel and spin the piece of equipment from inside. So uh, a lot of other uh, merry-go-rounds, accessible merry-go-rounds similar to this only allow someone to push from the outside, which is very, very difficult for someone in a wheelchair, but you can actually spin this device from inside the wheel, uh, inside the play equipment, so you, you have that sense of being included in the play, which is, is so great, important. That's great, that's great. Uh, and then on the right hand side, again, is another accessible piece, it's the Sway Fun, so there's accessible ramping up it's elevated place, so you're up off of the ground. Um, this has always been uh, challenging in a lot of playground projects where <clears throat> you, you can't necessarily get um, someone with mobility challenges or someone in a wheelchair off the ground to enjoy and, in, and be involved in the play that's up off the ground. So this is a perfect opportunity where you're getting off the ground being able to roll it, sort of like a seesaw type of feeling. Uh, there's some uh, uh, textures and, and play elements that uh, uh, are also incorporated into the space, so it's uh, another great feature for the park. Great. Um, and then again on the left hand side of the slide is the uh, double zip cruise. Um, that's actually a three bay, but we have a two bay zip cruise on our site and again it's a, a zip line rope on one side and then the inclusive bucket seat on the other side so uh, someone again with uh, mobility challenges or uh, uh, less ability with upper body strength can feel a lot more comfortable in the bucket seat uh, it's got uh, straps that will hold you in the seat so feel safe and again side by side uh, zip lines are a great feature to have for racing in the park with, uh, with your friends. What is the weight factor? Excuse me, no questions till after the um, orientation please. Thank you. And then on the right hand side, uh, this is an equipment, isn't equipment that's incorporated in phase one, but uh, just gives a sense of some of the opportunities for um, the, the aud auditory or sound um, elements, um, musical elements, um, and then obviously the climbing structure, which we don't have a feature that's quite um, like that, but uh, very similar. And these are actual pictures from the site, so you can see the, um, on the right hand side, the we go round, uh, merry go round feature with the rubber surfacing, and then we've got uh, the integrated coho salmon uh, art piece that was designed by uh, Noel Brown, a local SFN artist. So that was inlaid into the rubber surfacing. Um, and then again, on the left hand side is the, the rubber surfacing leading off of the pathway into the park area around the um, super netflex and, uh, and throughout the site. Um, the safety surfacing is is just as much of a play element as any of the equipment too, which uh, is a pretty special piece in this project. Um, it sort of depicts the uh, the feel and uh, I guess the culture and the, the history behind um, Fayoset Park and the site with the Millstone River running through and uh, integrating the Cobo salmon. Uh, we've also got some orange salmon that are swimming around the, the Super Netflex, almost looking like uh, um, salmon getting caught in, in a, uh, a fishing net. <laughs> like they were swimming up the, the Millstone River getting caught for, for dinner. Um, 
but uh, yeah, a really, really special site, special project, and uh, I'm really, really pleased with how things have turned out. Would love to have uh, have the group down to have a look. Maybe I'll turn it back to Kirsty if you want to. Now, any questions? Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. I'll keep Go going. On. So future phases, uh, you can see in the pictures uh, on the slides um, that phase two uh, is sort of in the northern section of the existing playground. Um, we've, we've maintained some play equipment there. Uh, they obviously still have some play value uh, and, and will be a utilized space over the next little while until we can uh, come up with a plan for, for our next phase um, to uh, Top you can also see the difference in the uh, safety surfacing there, so it will be maintained as peak gravel, but um, uh, still in a space that can be utilized for the time being. And then the next step, so I think the next steps, um, again, as Richard was explaining, I think there's opportunity um, for, for input and um, uh, further discussion around uh, phase two planning and design and, and uh, having valuable input from this, uh, from this committee for sure. Okay, I'm going to open it to questions and I believe the first one we had was Teresia. So it's Teresia again and my question is regarding the weight capacity on some of the swings and the, the zip line just should be not every every kid is going to be small. Just want to know what the weight capacity is. Uh, I I don't have an exact number, but it'll easily hold a grown adult. Okay. Okay, we're back to our screen. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll acknowledge you. Okay, not seeing any other questions. We're going to go on to our. Um, Advisor Committee on reports from Mr. Hardy. Oh, there'll be more questions. Yeah, I catch up to you now. Okay. We're rolling. You are. We'll wait for a date now to have a tour. Yes, we've got to get into discussion after the business. So, um, Chair, I'll, I'll be very, I'll be very brief because this is really the chance for the committee and the, the chair to now uh, uh, get roll these things up and do some work. So, on on page 24, we start with, um, as we mentioned on, on the inaugural meeting, was working towards developing of your of the committee's work plan. So, staff and with the assistance of uh, with Laura Clarkson who's here and also uh, Lynn Work. Um, of developing a, a, a draft for consideration so we have something to start with. And so we provided um, a number of, of initial um, thoughts and ideas and then also um, in, and added to it is some other thoughts you may want to add. But of course, the, the creativity around the table with this, with this group and this committee is there's things I'm sure that we've missed and not, not thought of and that's why we, we have an advisory committee like this. So quickly within on it, if I could, is just to, we put added in a, a few examples. One is the city spark or the overall planning, which um, Lisa Bhopal Singh provided. That is going to be a key component, but it is an ongoing component. Also, I see it's a year to two years of, of work and I won't go into that too, too much. Uh, we did do a report to Council um, just prior to COVID or just as COVID was starting, uh, uh, desire for us to update our LEAP program. And with that report, we requested that Council refer uh, the review of the LEAP program uh, to this committee for input and consideration. So that's one that we would like to continue with the committee and work, work through. Uh, guidelines and principles, this is, um, I might turn this to Lara or to, to Lynn to provide a little bit more detail, but really to create a guiding principle, uh, principle summary to help guide decision making specifically related to accessibility and inclusion for use in various areas of city operations. And then of course, um, as the committee continues with council, as projects um, will and issues referred to this committee as council desires. So again, um, Chair, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. We also added some other um, ideas um, yes, for future considerations. But again, we'll turn it over to you to answer any questions that um, we would have. But really, this is 
just a draft for the committee now to develop their, their work plan. What you do today is you work it through. We would then take your, your input and then and then work for a final a final work plan to present to council. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to the committee members. You've all had a chance to take a look at, at some of the suggestions made by um, staff. One of the, there's two things for me that I think are really big, which is I, I'm really big on undertaking the review of the LEAD program because I think that's a really important program for the city and something that needs to be looked at. And I also think we should really look to the guiding principles, um, ones that you feel that are important from your perspectives because you do bring a different, diverse opinion that is very important for us to hear. So those are two things I'd like to see. Um, and I'm gonna just go to Council Mark and I'm gonna do a round table. I'm, so, I'm with you. Those okay. would be my first two priorities. Okay. So I'm next gonna go to Aileen for your thoughts. Maybe I'll come back. I'll slip over to Sandra. Did Sandra leave? Okay. Yeah. Deb, how about you? Uh, I concur with your uh, recommendation. Okay. Then we're going to go to Adrian. She got Thank you. Um, I am. I'm just really excited at the thought of working on an ongoing basis through the, the city spark and um, having the ability to follow that engagement and be part of that engagement and be part of all of all of those connected interconnected plans. And I also think that the guiding principles were really key and these would probably be my third. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to go to Teresa. I think it's important that it's really be an inclusive site and not all the information be inclusive, so that means that it's available in various formats, meaning that it's available um, in Braille and it's available online and also so that you can look up your Braille, um, it's written in fact how a Braille reader, so it's got to be inclusive and, and also let the the part be geared towards all children, so children or adults with physical disabilities, developmental disabilities, and it's truly inclusive. I think those that have to be in the guiding principles. Okay. Otherwise, I think it's fantastic. Okay, Richard? I support this plan, and I'm happy to get started. <laughs> oh, awesome. And Linda, welcome. Um, thank you. I think uh, it's great, and I'm just very excited to be involved. Okay. Um, something that we haven't done, and I know our active transportation coordinator, should we be speaking at any time? Yeah, only if you'd like to, to so um, unless there any, any time you'd like to ask Yeah, any something because we do have our active transportation coordinator here, and I think maybe something we should talk about, because I've heard from people about the difficulty, especially for those uh, using canes or uh, walkers or wheelchairs to, to get around our community. So is there any questions you would have or recommendations that you would like her to hear about? Please raise your hand. And, oh, Aileen, we didn't get to you yet for your thoughts. Sorry. I don't think she can hear us. I, Aileen? Can you hear us, Aileen? Sandra's I, I, I'm not hearing a lot of what's being said. That's why I wanted to come down. Oh, we can hear you now. We're wondering how the work plan is for you. I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing a lot of what things, I'm not understanding it. Okay, uh, Aileen, what we'll do is I can meet up with you uh, later this week and go over stuff if that works for you. We'll do that. I'll follow up with Aileen myself afterwards. <laughs> okay, um, so let's go back to, um, does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to make around active transportation uh, as it stands in Nanaimo? Raise your hand if you do. If not, then we'll move ahead. Guess not. <laughs> well, that means we're doing um, good. Oh, oh, and Richard. Does that include like a sure. sidewalk and such too? Pardon me, Richard? Are you including sidewalks and such? Everything. Any, anything. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I guess there's a lot that I could like talk about in regards to that, but I don't know 
where to start type of thing. I think one of the things that we often look at is, is a lot of our, our our city's history is based on amalgamations of different group or different communities or communities, sorry, which makes it more difficult. But what I'm looking for is how can we move ahead in future projects, and then we should also maybe be looking at is there a way when we're, we're moving to retrofit stuff how it can be done. But before we do that, I'm going to go and have our active transportation coordinator speak first. I think. Sure, and I just. Um, I'm kind of close just because of the speed you'll have to yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Madeline. I'll try to yell too. Can you can you hear me? Is it, can everybody yeah, hear Madeline? Yeah, Thumbs up. That will increase the sound quality for the other people in the uh, Zoom call. I believe if, if everyone is speaking through the microphone, there's less echo. Maddie, are you okay to sit in that chair over there? And we can just push the. Okay, just stand by, we're just getting organized here. Just trying to get close to the microphone while maintaining a social distance. So. Okay, so we're gonna have Madeline, who's our app, one of our active transportation coordinators, speak a little bit about this. Uh... Oh, we've got another mic. Okay, that should really work, I have a microphone. There you go. Um, yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Madeline. Um, I'm the Active Transportation Project Specialist. So I've just started this position uh, just about a month ago now, and it's the first time that this has been a position with the city. So it's fairly brand new. I'm still getting up to speed personally on where we are with everything. Um, but as Lisa talked about briefly in the beginning, so an active transportation plan is part of the wider City Spark project. So definitely for that project, we're going to be asking for a lot of input from this committee. Um, so we'll look at everything, the full gamut of active transportation, so anything concerning walking, wheeling, cycling, um, skateboarding, and everything in between, um, how people can get around the city using those modes of transportation. Um, yeah, that's going to be a huge focus. I also wanted to make a suggestion if this was something that was of interest to the committee. We could look at doing um, a presentation at a future meeting similar to uh, the ones we had today where we could focus specifically on transportation yes. issues um, if that was of interest. So. Yeah, and then I, I could get more information too because I'm still learning as I say. But so. I think that's really good and I think for um, for Madeline to do her thing. It'd be interesting if you could send us some of the questions that you have, especially you, Richard, who I know you've done a lot on this, so that it's something that she could also include in their presentation so that she knows what we're looking for. So if people would be willing to do that, just send the questions in, um, to our group email and then legislative services will make sure they get to her so we can have her do a presentation at a later date. Does that work for everybody? I would be interested in in focusing on the transportation over the future. Okay, so we're going to look at that then. So um, we'll put that on hold. Richard, we'll put your comments on hold. And I will ask you to, to email a lot of your concerns so that it's something that she can look at and then be able to include in the presentation or maybe not be able to and it's something we can look at addressing from this committee's perspective. All right? Awesome. Thank you. Can I, if my day, can I just ask a question? So am I... Are we talking sidewalks and crosswalks and Any places downtown that yes. are dangerous? Yeah. Like, uh, I know that I've watched you before struggle on the cobbles, right? So things like that, I, like road surfacing. I, I've watched people tip over in their um, walkers when they hit the bump. So things like that are important. Like, people want to make things look pretty, but sometimes making things look pretty is not always the best for those with different needs. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more of really steep curb cuts, like outside the Coach Bastion um, on Front and Fitzwilliam. Um, there's just places where, you know, bushes have overgrown sidewalks and there's absolutely no way for a chair to get by. Um, there's, this is an issue all unto itself, even if we just restricted ourselves to downtown. Well, I think, I think those are really good points because some of those can be done, you know, depending on what things are, such as pruning and stuff, and things are um, identified. But we also have to look at, you know, what are, uh, I always say manpower, but I guess it's employee resources. power, resources. Yeah. <laughs> on the old There's lots of low hanging fruit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and I think, Madeline, you had a point you wanted to make, did you? 
No, I'm good. Okay. But good to know what so we can address in a future meeting. I'm just going to refer to Mr. Harding. Yeah, I'm just saying, if the committee is, is relatively comfortable with the draft work plan, we could receive a motion then, and we would forward this, just clean up a little bit and support it to council as the committee's work plan if there is such a motion. Okay. All right, is anybody prepared to make a motion to accept the work plan as it's been drafted? With the addition of back to transportation? Yeah, yeah and we'll, we'll, we'll add back to transportation as well. No, so I heard that moved by uh, Mr. Harding and seconded by Deborah. Oh, sorry, Harlow. <laughs> All those in favor? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Awesome. Aye. That's great. Oh, Thank you very much, committee. Okay, now we've got another one. And this is going to be introduced by Karen Robertson, our deputy clerk, and that's the uh, draft key date calendar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is just um, a report that um, sets out the uh, dates and times for the committee to meet. And uh, in reading the report by Sky Snellgrove, indicated that the committee would prefer to meet uh, 5 to 7, but during the COVID uh, crisis, it would be 3 to 5 p.m. So if the committees had the opportunity to view the key date calendar and if they're okay with it, we would just simply uh, get a motion from the committee to endorse it and we would move that forward to council for formal uh, endorsement by them. Is there a mover for this, if it's acceptable? I can move that, Linda. Okay, Linda moves, and I see seconded by uh, Adrian. Adrian. Well, any discussion? Okay, call the question, all in favor? Opposed? Aye. See none opposed, motion carries. Now that doesn't mean we can't add on special things like our visit to the park or whatever, just so you know, but that's, these are just our key meeting dates. We can always add other ones to them. Okay, now we're gonna move on to other business. So, I would like to come back to um, Richard, and Richard, Mr. Harlow, first on the idea of the Braille and plaques, I believe. What is COVID? Impact COVID. Oh, sorry, yours was the impact of COVID first. So, yeah, thank you. I'm confused here. So, Richard, if you oh, want sorry. to discuss your issues that you have with uh, the impact COVID's had on you and others? Um, well, uh, specifically, uh, um, I've kind of noticed, like, for people with visual impairments and such to be able to navigate businesses with the new layouts and signage and everything like that has been uh, difficult to navigate. Uh, but one thing that I've uh, noticed is now that businesses are having to think about uh, opening up and all that, having uh, sidewalk space be designed to be still accessible for people in wheelchairs and people with white canes, because a lot of stores are probably going to have to open up onto the sidewalks of their business and such. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you. I'm writing these and, down. Um, and the other uh, thing that I, I've been looking up is uh, bathroom accessibility needs to be looked at seriously and having um, the facilities pretty much be fully automatic, automatic water dispensing, automatic uh, kind of soap and all that because uh, those are key touch points which would also lower the risk of community transmission. Okay. Oops. Anything further, Richard, from you for the impacts on COVID? Um, those are just a couple things that I want to bring up specifically, I guess. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on the impacts of COVID that they've noticed? I think we have um, Deborah. And then there's Adrian. And then Adrian. Deborah, then Adrian. Right. Yeah. I don't have I don't have a lot to say. I just I think that it would be important that uh, we consider the impact of COVID as we move forward in terms of uh, everything from you know when we were speaking about the parks earlier, um, you know with Braille and, and all the necessities that if people are touching similar things. I think that we need to look at those safety protocols. Thank you. I think we're looking at a new normal. I don't think it's just a COVID situation. Yeah. I think we need to start putting these things in place. Yes. Whether or not we're in the middle of a pandemic, we now know the possibility of this and the impact that it might have. Yeah, and certainly, and even when it comes to the everyday flu, it would make a big difference. Um, Adrian? Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, in 
terms of COVID and underlying medical conditions to um, um, and accessibility, the, the sidewalk comes up there as well. I, I live in the Old City Quarter and, and I'm working from home and took a, a walk with my kids the other day at lunch and it's so interesting, you know, uh, um, there was somebody who was walking up to William and we were walking down and so my daughter moved over to the edge of the sidewalk but there wasn't enough space really and so I was trying to coax her off the sidewalk and said, well no mom, you know, can stay on the sidewalk and the this person needs more space and we have the opportunity to move on to the, the grassy side so we're going to do that because we're going to allow for this space and this distancing. And so that's, I mean, I'm sure the sidewalks are standard width, but it's, it's, it's really something. I, I thought about it and thought, wow, our whole, the whole way that we are structuring things and are thinking about the way we're structuring things will have to change to keep each other safe. And, and I know that it's not probably feasible to address every sidewalk or, or um, you know, grassy side of a sidewalk in the city, but it's something to, to think about moving forward and thinking about different options that we may have. Yeah, one, one of the things that other cities are doing is that you walk facing traffic, and then you never have the problem of having to face on head on with anybody. So that's something we could certainly look at doing, and it's it's a it's a good. The difficulty in the difficulty in Nanaimo with that idea is the lack of sidewalks on the yeah. path. You know, there there are some places I know in my own neighborhood where I would love to walk facing traffic, but I can't because I'm almost walking in traffic. You yeah. Do that. No but but when it can be done, that's what they're utilizing. So, um, is there any other questions, Aileen? Did you have your I hand just up? Wanted to make. Go, oh, sorry, Council Martin. I I am just adding to the subject of sidewalks. I've never paid so much attention to them in my life, uh, but I do now, or the lack of them. And our city was built without sidewalks. That's the way it is, and and so we've got a lot lot of work to go on in the future. But one thing I think that could be changing was we had a presentation from staff at our council meeting with sidewalks were designed at a certain width in order for two people to walk by. They were not designed at a certain width for two wheelchairs to go by. And maybe uh, as we move forward in the future and we're aware of being social distance, I don't think that's going to change um, with pandemics or flus, etc. That maybe going in the future we're going to have to make wider sidewalks so that wheelchairs could pass each other or other people could pass each other at a, at a distance. But it will be piecemeal because they're very, very expensive. Yes, that's right. I thought, Can I, sorry, hands up? I've had my hand up a while. <laughs> Who's that? I can't see. Linda. Linda? Linda, okay, yeah, your hand doesn't show up. You just have your face there, that blue box. Oh, oh your blue box. box. Oh, no, I've been putting my hand up in the... I didn't realize you were using the chat after the hand. hand. Okay, go ahead, Linda, sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, there are some... Um, BC Building Code changed in 2018. I'm not sure what the requirement for sidewalks is. I know that the Rick Hansen Foundation has guidelines for hallways and sidewalks that they do need to be wide enough for two wheel vehicles to pass. And of course, that's going forward. Or not vehicles, like two wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, people for me often have to step into traffic. Um, to, because I can't step off the curb, somebody has to step off the curb. Um, so that's, that's just a, a follow-up on the previous comments. One of the things that I was, I was thinking about in COVID, and I, this is just a, a wish, but to be outside, um, sometimes you need a windbreak, you know, not even a roof. Um, to socialize with people. And I'm, I'm just wondering if there's places in the city or if there's things that we can do that are are not very expensive that would allow people to be, um, like I know in a wheelchair I get very cold because I can't work up mm -hmm. um, any heat while I'm moving. So um, to be outside with people means it has to be a really, really beautiful day. And I was just wishing there were somewhere in the city that was big enough that I could either be indoors with another person or outside but out of the wind, you know? So I, I don't know if there's temporary walls or um, just something like that that creates a bit of a, 
a space for people to sit and be, but be safe. Does that make sense? Yeah, Madeline wanted to, to make a comment, so I'll turn to her. Um, all I wanted to say is that this is just really good discussion, um, and I think it will be something great to bring up again when we do the transportation session. I'm sitting here going, I know if my manager was in the room right now, you probably have a lot of really good information to add, but I'm just taking good notes. Um, I also wanted to say um, that we, the, just uh, about the expanding uh, the sidewalks, uh, don't want to give any too many spoilers right now, but staff are preparing a report about that for the downtown, which should be the agenda should be available. I think it should be available tomorrow for Monday's council meeting. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Harding. So through the chair to you, Linda. Uh, so um, I'm going to turn over to Linda to um, Lynn in a second. So what we're trying to do with parks recreation, particularly, is start to rethink what how we're doing. Uh, recreation this summer and then as we as we deal with um, you know reopening and, and the gradual reopening of buildings and looking at, at alternative uses and trying to keep people out and active so um, that's a good example of one where um, you know we're, we've been really working to keep our parks open we put in the council allowed us to put in park ambassadors and and do different things but that one aspect of enclosed um, but still safe that's a good point um, to think about because I know we're, we're looking at some of our facilities as a some gradual opening um, and I don't know if Lynn's got some ideas or I'm just put her on the spot. Lynn, go ahead. Well, I, I don't know. Um, I can say that our a team of us is meeting on Friday morning to have a large brainstorming session around how we can retrofit our buildings and make changes to our buildings to accommodate the reopening for COVID. And I'm just thinking based on our conversation here today that we'll be able to incorporate some of the information that we've learned today into that brainstorming session and keep it in mind um, as we're thinking about reopening. But our whole reopening strategy is going to involve facilities, but it's also going to involve programs and events and staff from parks and recreation. So we'll just have to um, Keep in mind that we have this committee as a resource. That's great. Thank you. I'm, I have a, a question, I guess. Is um, the space above the sidewalk being considered in any of these plans? Because, like, for me personally, I've been uh, taking up running. And I've been finding that it's safer for me to run in the road than it is on the sidewalk because of low hanging branches sometimes. That's a good point. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room can even answer that. I can jot it down. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll come back with that because I, I know the same thing when I go for walks being tall, I quite often have to duck, duck under trees. It is for And it can be different after like it's just rained, just because the branches have <laughs> absorbed some of the water, right? Yeah, and some homeowners just don't cut them as, as short or as high as they should be. They leave them relatively low. Because I know I've had to go to some of my neighbors and ask them to cut them back. So. Is yeah, right? yeah. Um, through the chair to you, Richard. I guess the other thing too, Richard, is just I don't know how well we are aware of all our other facilities in the city and where there could be some other opportunities for you to run. Um, as you know, we, we now own um, and purchased a number of years ago with Council's direction, uh, Rotary Bowl, which is a nice, good, safe running running track that you can, you can run on. Um, and you know, provides, and then we have a, 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 some other tr trails and opportunities where you, you know, the in and trail and other, other spots. So, and it, it, you're right, it's, it's the sidewalks don't always provide those things for you, but it's, I'm not sure how well, like, where you are of all the other facilities we may have throughout the city that could provide some running opportunities for you. See, I think that's what, what Mr. Harding said is a good point. That's another thing we can look at is like a resource, like we've talked about before, a resource that if people are blind, where are good trails that, you know, you're not going to be impacted by this. People have wheelchairs. Where is a good trail that you can go where you don't have to worry about getting bumps? And, like, I think we need to start, that's, a, that's an area that we need, to, that this committee could really have a great impact on when we start building our resources for the community. Yeah, so we can have like things that we need to target accessibility, but things that are already accessible to begin with and are great for like these groups of people. Now I think I saw. It's just the idea of a monster. And I think, did Sandra? I think Sandra, didn't you have a comment? No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Who's next? Can you raise your hand, Linda? 
Go ahead, Linda. Isn't it? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that I am so um, impressed by the way the city has, uh, I mean, if you can pass this on to your colleagues in the city, the way city council and uh, all the employees at the city have handled this COVID situation, I think you've been doing great. It's great communication. And the fact that you're keeping this committee running and doing all you are doing is um, it's just so positive and I'm so impressed. So, well, well, thank you. It was really, it was really important to Zenny and I and to staff to have this committee back up and running because now is the time when we really need to start looking at this because the impacts, as we've stated, are huge. You know. Yeah. And, and, if, and, if, and as we move forward, if we could start taking some of the suggestions, we're not going to be able to do them all. We'll be honest. But you know, when dollars come in, and it, there's budget decisions that have to be made. But some of these things are as simple as trimming back trees. Like that doesn't cost a lot of money. So these are things that are really good ideas that, that this committee can really help us move forward. I'm sorry, I can go to legislative department. Sorry, I was just going to note that Eileen has put something on the chat up there to add to the accessibility issues that as a deaf person who relies upon lip reading, talking to a person wearing a mask is very difficult. Oh. And for people who are partially wearing masks and screens, muffle conversations, so full face shields for some reason are a little easier. Um, that's a really good point about the full face shields. I was out and about today and I know that quite a few businesses are using the full face shields versus the mask, but it's, I think it's the employees, but that's a really good point. And I think that's something we can take further. Um, as a matter of fact, it might be a good suggestion that we send to the uh, chamber as well, that uh, as a result of discussions at this table, that businesses might want to think about that. So thank you, Aileen, great point. I highly support this. Okay, so I'm gonna use that. If, if everybody's in favor of that, we can maybe, uh, are you part of the chamber? I vote all the chambers. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, gonna, dev. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let uh, Council Markman look at that because she is one of the co-chairs of the uh, Dev as well as she's involved with the chamber. So I think that's a really good point, and that's something that she can take forward to that committee as well. So thank you very much. And I, if I'm right, was did we get an award? Was that the retiring, retreading? This for the playground, yeah. The yeah, oh, I just uh, wanted to mention it to those on the committee that might not be aware. So Richard, um, what did we won an award for the retreading of the retreading? We, we got a grant for the retreading. Yeah. Scott Newlands has submitted a grant application um, and through council's approval, and we were we awarded it. So help help pay. And those are the kind of the grants that they're that both Kirsty and Scott were talking about as we start looking at phase two. Because I think when we open up phase one, people are going to say, we need to do more of this. And I think there's going to be a lot of energy to kind of continue. And so I know one of our last bits of business is to kind of see if we can find an on-site meeting time that we can go through the, the phase one with you. Yeah. But, yeah. Is there anybody? Congratulations. Yes, I just I really want to thank um, Richard and all the staff for the work they're doing, and, and not only that, because people are genuinely caring about this committee, and I and I really appreciate that they're here because they want to be. Like I mean, look at the numbers that are in this room. Quite often, committees only have one or two staff, and we've got a lot here because they're really interested in moving this forward. So I really want to thank from the committee and myself. Thank you all for your work on this. It's awesome. It really makes a difference when we have staff that are involved and really want to make a difference. So thank you. On the face shield uh, topic, I'm kind of curious, like, is there any suggested, like, assistance or guidelines or anything like that that can be given for, um, for businesses uh, to be able to, like, interact with people with, like, visual impairments and such? Because it's really hard to, you know, uh, be guided in the space when you're having to, like, hold on to someone's arm, for instance. Um, to still keep that like six feet rule or being able to read signs or being able to know which alleys are, are good to walk down and such. Um, it's an interesting point. Like a lot of this falls under the provincial mandate, but there's certain things we can certainly look at. But uh, when it comes to masks and stuff, that's all, and that's all up to the businesses and stuff. But I think it's, I think it's a matter of, I think a lot of people probably didn't even realize it. So if we even just get the word out through Zinni and through other people, yeah. People may start to think in those terms. I want to ask Richard, um, what would help? I'm trying to think, Richard, from a um, visually impaired point of view, what would help in a store 
Um, I'm a sighted person and I, and I sometimes go down the wrong way. So what, what is it that could help somebody? Um, so like, there's for instance those uh, like tactile more tape that you can even put down on um, little flat surfaces. It's so when the cane actually rolls over it, you can actually tell that that's, oh. like, that's an arrow or like a triangle or a box could be like two different signifiers for instance. And it could be done in like high visibility because for instance, I've seen in, uh, I think it was Save On Foods, I can't even tell which lanes are which um, because the, the line is so thin right. and so close to the color of the actual brown that I can't see the difference. And so like I've walked into people and I've actually had negative interactions. One guy told, told me, watch where the F you're going. Um, I'm so not like, meaning to laugh, but it's horrible. Yeah. Yeah, people's emotions so, are really high right now. Yeah. But these are really good points, and like, because they're things that a lot of times we don't think about, right? So it's really important that you bring this to the table. It doesn't mean we're going to be able to fix them all, but there's maybe some that we can help with or move ahead, especially when it's within the city's jurisdiction. So, you know, keep them coming. Well, I can, these two suggestions, I can forward to Kim at the chamber uh, to do what he will, but just letting him know that this came up at our committee meeting and here's some suggestions for retailers. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Um, now let's move forward on to, uh, unless there's more talk about COVID, does anybody have anything else? Sandra had her hand up. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say with masks, it's not only reading lips, but there are individuals with diverse needs where the, the full mask is really scary. So I um, children with autism, so on my child hasn't been in a store since this began, but the mask, um, especially a full one, would be very disturbing to her. So it's not as so much as you can change it, but it is awareness um, for businesses to know that, um, that for some individuals, it can be a very scary situation when they don't know what's going on. That's a really good point. Thank you. And going around again, is there any others? Throw up your hands. I think we're good. Okay, so let's move forward to, are people interested in going to look at the uh, inclusive park? Throw up your hands if you're interested. Definitely. Okay. Yes. So yeah. we need to find my hands up. Okay, we need to find some dates at work. Um, and times. I'm just going to turn to Mr. Hardy for a minute to get some suggestions from him as what he thinks is the best day, time, whatever. So staff will make whatever time works for the committee and whatever is best. Um, so uh, we always find Thursdays and Fridays better for committee members and, and council members, but uh, we're open to, to other, other thoughts. Um, weekends are a little more difficult to run the parks are busier and it's harder to explain to people. Um, plus Monday and Friday we'll have the con contractors on site we won't be in their way. So um, I So what's, what's people's preferences? Um, does Thursdays work by a show of hands if Thursday works? We have one. Um, yeah. Two? Linda, does Thursday work? Um, I can make it work. Okay. Uh, Wednesdays are better for me, but if Thursdays are our best, I can make that work. Does Wednesdays work for the rest of you since we already have our normal time? If we did like a 3 o'clock, is 3 o'clock too late? Because then I'm thinking we would know what the weather would be like by it. Go ahead. Sorry, I see someone's hand. I can't see. I got the glasses off. Debra, is Debra go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I was just raising my hand to say Wednesday works. So maybe we should, if we st stayed with a Wednesday at 3, which is our normal times, and then just pick a Wednesday. Do you want to try next Wednesday? What's the weather supposed to be like? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Scott, you know all. But just do it fast, because I don't really want to go if it's pouring rain. It says sun at 19. Sun at 19 on Wednesday, so it should be set for 3 o'clock, and then we'll know what the weather's like, and if there's a change, we will send something out by 1 o'clock. Does that work for people? And if we could, we, we would meet just by the blue, by the by the uh, spirits, the spirit tent. Uh, that's the, the blue blue tent, um, right by the washrooms at Mathail Sutton Park. Sure. The, the structure okay. there. So maybe um, I'm just going to check with uh, Ms. Gerard. Are we able to send the instructions out? Did you get back them? Wednesday at uh, Wednesday at three o'clock, yeah. May twenty seventh. Email by one. Yeah. If, if it's, it's not canceled, yeah. Yeah. and meet. 
by the blue tent spirit. Yeah, it's a spirit. It's what we call the spirit square, but a spirit tent. It's oh, the it's the big structure with the blue the covered right by the washroom. So we'll send an invite out to everybody because I know there's some people that aren't here, but I think it's really good things. It's always better to see firsthand than uh, not. So. And then if if I could, if you have some. Um, the little playground specialists that live with you, like Sandra, they're more than welcome to come along too. Well, that's great, yeah. Bring kids or, or anybody that you feel would be interested in it. We just gotta remember, we gotta keep our social distancing, that's all. But if you're in the same family, it's not an issue. Okay, so thank you. Yes. Um, Try new business, now I think we talked about, we already talked about the Braille, which we'll talk about at a later date. Site visit we've done. We're all interested in the uh, the transportation as at one of our next upcoming meetings. So we'll ask for that to whatever works for them and, and they'll work through that with legislative services. We still have a bit of time. Is there any other business people would like to discuss or put up your hands? Oh, I think we're looking pretty good. I just want to thank everybody for taking the time. And this is my first meeting chairing a Zoom meeting and it's, it's difficult. I like That's why we sort of had suggested the uh, down at the Shaw Auditorium because there's lots of room to socially distance. But if people are happy with this, we'll continue with this. Um, I'm going to see if Amy wants to come down because I can always bring her down. It might be easier for her to hear. So thank you all very much. And uh, since I think that we have no other business, then I'm just going to call for an adjournment. Have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Councilor Markman, seconded by Deborah. All in favor?